Welcome to the Southern IPM Hour, and this one is on cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, um, and it's presented by the Southern IPM Center, where we present research issues and programs in integrated pest management from the Southern region through this webinar series. This IPM Hour takes place on the first Wednesday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Kayla Watson. I am the Communication Director for the Southern IPM Center, and we are housed at NC State and UGA with a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. We are also at the Southern IPM Center, one of four regional IPM centers supported by USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. For the webinar today, if you have questions, we ask that you put those into the Q&A box as we go along, or you can wait till the end, and we will be answering those questions at the end as well. So um, that Q&A box is located on your Zoom control panel, and it's down there um, with the chat and um, mute and things like that if you've never used Zoom webinar before. Uh, today we have three speakers, so we're really excited about that from our cotton leaf roll dwarf virus working group. And they are Drs. Cassie Connor, Amanda strayer Scherer, and Austin Hagen. And um, they're gonna be speaking with us about their cotton leaf roll dwarf virus sentinel plot working group and their findings through collaborations across the cotton belt. So Dr. Cassie Connor is an extension plant pathologist and director of the uh, Auburn University Plant Diagnostics Library. Uh, Dr. Amanda strayer Scherer is an assistant professor and extension plant pathologist in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at Auburn University. And Dr. Austin Hagen is an emeritus professor of plant pathology and visiting professor in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Um, so we're really excited to see you and Cassie, we'll let you go ahead and kick it off. Okay, thank you. So um, I am Cassie Connor. Uh, and I am actually the director of the Auburn University Plant Diagnostic Lab, although it does feel like a library most of the time. <laughs> so we are talking today about the um, cotton leaf roll dwarf virus sentinel plot working group. I'm going to talk um, mostly about the background of CLRDV and how the working group was kind of formed. And then Dr. Hagen is going to talk about the results from across the cotton belt. And then Dr. Scherer is going to talk more about the um, sentinel plots within Alabama. So cotton leaf roll dwarf disease is what the disease is now called. Um, it's caused by cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, which is in the genus Polarivirus. <clears throat> Polariviruses are known to have low titers in plant tissue. Um, so it causes a problem for the diagnostics and detection of the virus. Uh, CLRDV is transmitted by the cotton aphid. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. There are three strains of the virus. <clears throat> there is the typical strain, which is the original disease that was described in Africa. It was called cotton blue disease. And then in 2006, uh, the virus broke resistance and this strain was identified as the atypical strain. And now the strain that we have in the US has been shown to be um, different enough that it is its own strain. So worldwide, um, CLRDV is present across the globe. It was, like I said, first described in Africa around 1950. It was described as cotton blue disease because of the color change that it created within the plants, made a bluish tint to the plants. Um, it's also present in Brazil and Argentina where they have not only the typical strain, but that's where they had the resistance breaking and they have the atypical strains there. It's also found in India and in Thailand and outside of Australia. Um, and then it was found in the United States in Alabama in 2017. And since then, it has been found in China, in Uzbekistan, in Chickpea, and in South Korea this year in hibiscus. So more about the atypical strain of the virus. Um, this popped up in 2006 in Brazil. 
where they started seeing symptoms in the cotton blue disease resistant plants. But they exhibited sort of a different symptoms. Uh, they had mild cotton blue symptoms with red withered leaves and accentuated verticality. And we see a lot of these symptoms in the United States as well. And as I said, they um, identified this as an atypical strain because it was divergent enough from um, the other strains. In the US, as I said, the virus was first identified in Alabama in 2017 from samples that were collected from Macon County, uh, not Macon County, Barber County, I think, which is down here in um, Southeast Alabama. Um, and samples were sent off to the University of Arizona to Judy Brown, who was a virologist, and she had done whole genome sequencing and tentatively identified the virus as CLRDV. Uh, but once we started telling people about it and showing them pictures of the symptoms that it caused, we then found out that crop advisors had been seeing the disease before we actually identified it. So they, we've had people tell us, you know, they've seen the symptoms five years ago or 10 years ago, but definitely at least the year before, um, although none of that can really be confirmed. So once we figured out that this was cotton leaf rolled dwarf virus, um, we got diagnostic protocols in place, which um, are PCR, which happened to be very expensive and time consuming, since this is a low titer virus. And we started doing um, distribution studies across the state. Uh, in Alabama, we found it in all sides of the state, from north to south and east to west. Um, and then in 2018, our neighbors around us also found the virus. Um, Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida it was confirmed there as well. Also in 2018, since we had diagnostic protocols in place, we started testing weed hosts and we found it in a number of weed hosts. Some of the main ones is henbit and white clover. So I said it's transmitted by the cotton aphid and it's transmitted in a persistent manner. Uh, it can be transmitted by viruliferous aphids in as little as 40 seconds. And then it can be transmitted for up to 12 days. This is what is in the literature from Brazil and Argentina where they've done some of this work, but we have an entomologist um, here at Auburn that has um, reproduced some of these studies and has actually been filling in some of these gaps in knowledge of acquisition and transition. So it's actually impossible to control the disease with insecticides. We have an entomologist here at Auburn, and she's been working with an entomologist at UGA, and they set up trials looking at aphid control to see if it would control the disease. And they found that they could never 100% eliminate the cotton aphid, but also no matter what, what sort of um, sprays that they used, how often they used them, they were not able to reduce disease incidents, even under intensive sprays. So why are we worried about CLRDV? So it's been reported in Brazil to cause up to 80% yield loss in susceptible varieties. And we haven't really seen that here in the United States yet, but we are still trying to get a better handle on what kind of yield, um, yield loss this virus does cause here. Uh, the symptoms are very strange. Um, we found that the symptoms can vary based on a number of things, timing of infection, the variety you're using, environmental conditions, nutritional status, stress factors. There are just a lot of different factors that can contribute to different symptomologies. We've also found that we can have plants that are asymptomatic that will test positive, and we can found that we've had plants that look symptomatic that sometimes test negative. So some of the symptoms that we see, we see stunting, um, and this is when infection occurs very early, when the plants are just coming up. <clears throat> you can get these small distorted chlorotic leaves that kind of look like herbicide damage, 
And we usually see this when plants are infected later um, in the life cycle. You can get this leaf curling and this leaf cupping or this abnormal growth. They can curl upward or they can curl downward. You get this bunchy top growth where you get a bunch of um, buds all in one spot. You can get node stacking where you have this um, shortened internodal space. You get red veins uh, and red petioles also. Um, and this can be much more intense than what's seen in this picture. This is just um, a good representation of what we commonly see. You can get drooping and wilting. Um, and all these plants from these pictures have tested positive and no other diseases were identified on them. Um, more recently, we're seeing more leaf bronzing um, as one of the main symptoms and sort of a drooping of the leaves. And in fact, some people have tried to associate this virus with the cause of um, bronze disease, but nobody's been able to really show that yet. And you can get this um, rugosity or this crinkling of the leaves. And this is actually really common on regrowth. And then in 2018, Dr. Hagen found this field in Baldwin County where we could see this accentuated verticality where the plants shoot up in growth, like they have a whip at the top and then they have no bowls set at the top. So once we, once Dr. Hagen found this field, we had some um, other people here at Auburn that started getting the rest of the um, cotton agronomists and entomologists and plant pathologists from around the cotton belt to try and get them to come down here and look at this to see what this virus can actually cause. And so that's when we actually decided to set up the sentinel plots. So we started this group with agronomists, entomologists, plant pathologists from Virginia all the way to Texas to set up the same plots in each state so we can see what environmental factors um, had on the symptomology and so that we could see the range of the disease. So we were mainly looking at symptom by variety by environment interactions. Uh, like I said, we wanted to determine the disease range because uh, obviously it's down here in the southeast, but we wanted to see if it was across the entire cotton belt because the, the um, vector can be found across the entire cotton belt. We wanted to see if there was a planting date effect on disease, and then we wanted to try and get a handle on yield loss estimates. So we had co cooperators from each state. Um, they planted, maintained, and monitored the plots. Um, they had options of either one or two planting dates in early and the late to see if the planting date affected the disease incidence and severity. Uh, the initial year in 2019, we had six varieties. Um, same varieties were used across all the sentinel plots. And then we had a postdoc here at Auburn that went out to all of the different sentinel plots, collected samples from all of them and rated for the disease. In this initial year, we were able to get the Southern IPM Center Critical and Emerging Issues Grant to support some of this diagnostics for 100, we just tested once that year at 120 days. And we also got um, Alabama Cotton Commission funds to do expanded testing within the state of Alabama. So I said we did expanded testing in Alabama. We actually have five locations in Alabama and Dr. Scherer will go back into this later. And in Alabama, we actually had two or three planting dates that first year. Um, several of the states had two planting dates. Some had uh, more than one location. These are the common cultivars that we used. We tried to pick ones that were common, commonly used. And then we used two Brazilian lines that were supposed to have um, resistance to typical and atypical cotton blue disease. And that year, those two lines did both test positive for the virus. 
From the 2019 Sentinel plots, we were able to find the virus in South Carolina, North Carolina, Louisiana, and Texas. Those were all new locations for the virus. <clears throat> and um, each of these states, well, not each of them, but several of the Southern states did their own little mini surveys um, so they could write up first reports or disease notes. And so we kind of combined all of that information into this one map. So for 2020 and 2021, we decided to go after the Southern IPM Center Working Group funds um, so that we could sort of solidify the group and working together in the collaboration. Um, we were, and that was intended to sample all the plots at 90 and 120 days. And Cotton Incorporated also threw in some money for five to six states to monitor for um, the presence of the virus throughout the season and samples were collected at 30, 60, 90, and 120 days. And then the University of Arizona received NIFA funding to monitor for variants. So here at Auburn, where we were running the samples, we were saving all the positive samples and sending those off to the University of Arizona. And um, they were doing the variant work to look for um, mutations within the genome, and that work's still ongoing. They're now looking at the 2021 data. So our working group met three to four times a year. Uh, we discussed what we were seeing in each state, um, who was seeing more virus, who was seeing less, what sort of symptoms we were seeing, what the aphid pressure was in each state. And we also discussed um, management recommendations further work that needs to be done, um, any sort of tweaks that need to be made to the Sentinel plot protocols, those sorts of things. And I'm not gonna go into the results, I'll save that for Dr. Hagen and Dr. Chair, uh, but I will say this, within any new pathosystem that comes into the United States, there's always gonna be <clears throat> more questions than there are answers. And so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to find out if there are additional vectors beyond the um, cotton aphid, if there's any germplasm that has resistance or tolerance to the virus, um, if there's an interaction between this virus and other cotton diseases, um, what sort of fertility interactions there are, what are the other stress factors that can induce severe disease to cause um, increased yield losses, what kind of effects cover crops have on the whole parathos system. There's just still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, with that, I would like to thank the Southern IPM Center, um, Alabama Cooperative Extension System, Alabama Agricultural Experiment Station, Alabama Cotton Commission, Cotton Incorporated, and NIFA. And more importantly, I would like to thank all of the uh, collaborators that we have worked with on this. All of these states set up these plots with little to zero funding uh, to do this work. So we are incredibly thankful to all of them. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Sher or no, to Dr. Hagen. Thank you, Cassie. Um, I'm the postdoc that uh, did all this work was uh, Mar Marcio Zaracon, uh, and uh, he, he has since left Auburn University for uh, another pasture. And so I'm going to review and summarize the results of the Sentinel Plot project uh, that were run, well, that has been run for uh, three years. Now, some of the data is slightly incomplete and I'm not going to go into all the grubby details either because we'd be here all day long but uh, uh, I just want to hit some of the high points so Cassie you want to tap go to the next slide thank you Cassie already reviewed to some degree the distribution of the disease in Alabama this uh, as she mentioned uh, Drew Shrimpshire a uh, graduate student with Kathy Lawrence was the individual originally, and he worked as a cotton consultant uh, that uh, really recognized that this disease was present, or at least there was something new that he hadn't seen. Uh, 
uh, and he was the one that originally collected the samples, got them to Kathy, and then got them uh, to Judy Brown, which subsequently resulted in the identification of uh, CLRDB in cotton in Alabama. Now, beginning in 2018, once we realized that this virus had been identified, uh, those of us that work in cotton began to look for symptoms of the disease. Now, originally, a lot of the stuff that uh, uh, symptoms that he photographed were actually more leaf rugosity, really, and maybe some stunning other than anything else. And those were the symptoms we originally keyed on, but we were also generally just looking at cotton. And Cassie mentioned we found it in extreme southwest Alabama, really severe accentuated verticality. Um, but through the sampling that we did in 2018, 19, and then into 2020, essentially, uh, at least as far as Alabama is concerned, the virus is, is basically present wherever cotton is grown in the state. Now, there is quite a difference in the distribution or incidence of the disease, I should say, across the state, and we'll get to that. And that's the reason why the uh, survey program was put in place. Go ahead, next one, Cassie. And as she already mentioned, the symptom pattern that really struck us, and certainly a situation where there was associated yield loss had to do with accentuated verticality that showed up in fields in Baldwin County. And these same symptom patterns were observed in 2019 here and in other uh, areas of uh, uh, Alabama, but subsequently we really haven't seen uh, all that much accentuated verticality in, uh, in Alabama cot. But the, the whips or long terminals uh, produced or associated with this symptom pattern were very noticeable. Uh, the internode distances were very short, but there were numerous internodes, maybe up to 20 or more sterile internodes above the last ball. Uh, there were squares produced on these uh, shoots, but they were shed. So we never had ball formation on these accentuated verticality shoots or whips. And in the far right-hand corner, it gives you a good idea. You can see the open bowls in the bottom of the canopy, but the vast majority of the plant is sterile. So she mentioned yield losses in uh, Brazil, for example, being in the 80% range. There were some of these fields uh, in 2018 where the yields were uh, potential yield loss was quite high. Go ahead, Cassie. Can I do that? So anyway, they're, they're beginning at the, at the end of 2018, there really no one had any idea as the distribution of this particular disease or the virus in cotton across the cotton belt. It, it was something that we really needed to find out. We were quite concerned with what was observed in, um, uh, in 2018, and that was the rationale for beginning this, uh, this survey program. So the main question was the distribution of, of the virus. The second was, could we actually see any differences in the level of disease among the cultivars? And that was the reason for the six, uh, the six cultivars we had one from each of the major uh, seed companies, as well as the Brazilian lines for that particular year, and then try and get some idea of the symptomatology, because as I said, we were seeing a lot of different things, and there was a question as to whether or not location had an effect, as well as cultivar. Cassie, there you go. Uh, Cassie showed you the varieties that were shown in 2019. These, uh, on this particular slide for 2020, we did reduce the number of cultivars. The reason for that was the, uh, the two Brazilian lines uh, proved to be as susceptible to the virus as the commercial lines that we were screening. And it was 
just to simplify, simplify the sentinel plots, those lines were dropped. Uh, also, there was more of a, we changed some of the lines to uh, those that were widely grown, plus uh, a, a line that actually the, the uh, Dynagro 3615 was actually supposedly sensitive to bronze wilt, and we thought preliminarily there might be an association there. That variety was added. And then for 2021, the, the experimental line was re replaced with Vitagen 500. So there's been some changes in the makeup of the lines that have been included in this study uh, over the period it was conducted. Uh, these are the states that Cassie Benson were involved in the, uh, in the project. Not everybody had multiple locations. Not everybody had multiple planning dates. Alabama had two locations where we had two, lo uh, two planning dates and three other single planning date locations. Uh, Florida had two locations and then Texas had two planning dates, but, uh, but one location. So it, you know, the inputs uh, varied a good bit. Now, one of the things in, with these trials is the attempt was made to make sure that the growing conditions were ideal for cotton. So you're trying to stay away from drought stress or nutrient stress uh, related disorders to kind of take any symptoms that were associated with those out of the equation, or at least it was an attempt to do that. Cassie, there we go. Uh, this, Cassie showed this uh, image a moment ago. Again, it just points out to the locations that were included in the uh, Sentinel plot program. Of course, we do have cotton production in Oklahoma and Kansas. Those states also were, and along with Missouri, were not in, included in the survey. If I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, the virus was detected in cotton in Kansas. I'm pretty sure they got it in Oklahoma, but I don't think it's been picked up at this point in uh, in Missouri. So. I mean, at least we got most of the cotton producing states in the Southeast uh, and the South involved in this project, just again, to get an idea of the distribution and incidence of this disease uh, in cotton. Go ahead, Cassie. She went over a lot of the material and methods. Uh, so just to quickly recap, all the locations were visited, visited by Marcio about 90 days after planning. So we had the same person doing the ratings at all of the survey locations. We didn't, the problem with this disease is when you come to symptoms, it kind of looks different to different people. So you really, it was important to have one individual do all of the uh, survey work involved in symptomatology. And so the idea was to look at the, or determine the percentage of plants showing some different symptom patterns. The one that didn't really show up at all was the accentuated verticality, simply because the assessment was done at 90 days after planting. Usually those symptoms really don't become noticeable uh, until a little bit later in the uh, growth cycle of the plants, usually at least 120, 130 days um, uh, after planting. Another symptom that tends to show up from time to time is the uh, shortening of the inner nodes, basically a stunning in the, in the tops of the terminals. That kind of comes and goes depending on the situation and, and, and is not seen all that often. To establish the occurrence of the virus in a plot, there were samples taken from each plot, five leaves were collected, the, the leaves were separated from the petioles, and the petioles were tested using RT-PCR procedures, real-time PCR, and all that work was done at the Auburn University Diagnostic Lab, again, just so that it was a standardized methodology PCR procedure used because different labs may, in some situations, come up with different results. So at least they're all done by the same lab to standardize the, uh, the results. Cassie. And just to touch on the symptom patterns, again, she, she showed a few of them. We have uh, some wilting, tenting, and a uh, 
kind of either a bronzing or reddening of the uh, of the leaves of some of the plants on the left. In the center, more of the leaf rugosity as well as the reddening of the leaves and the petioles, which is sometimes seen. And then on the right hand side is the accentuated verticality, which, as I mentioned, um, really was not uh, um, something that was looked at, at least in this survey. Cassie. And other symptoms, the leaf cupping or folding of the terminal leaves um, in a more severe pattern, symptom pattern, kind of a continuation of, of one of the plants on the, uh, that was shown on the previous slide is you get a definite bronzing, uh, excuse me, of the leaves, a folding of the leaves, and then the reddening of the stems in some cases. And there were also situations where you would go out and, and see what looked like a perfectly normal plant where there simply were no, uh, there was simply no ball set on the plants. And we tested those plants. They did show some reddening of the stems and they ended up testing positive for the virus. Uh, so uh, it, it, it really tough and I'll, and I'll emphasize it in diagnosing this disease and just looking at, uh, at the foliage. Go ahead, Cassie. So we got some numbers here. Again, this is a percentage of plots with positive plants. It's not a true indices of the occurrence of the disease. We didn't take a lot of samples from individual plots of each cultivar and, uh, and run them in that manner. Simply, it's a cost issue because each sample uh, to process using real-time PCR costs is about $30 a piece. So any real extensive sampling would be uh, uh, quite expensive. But from here, over the sampling locations, you can get a good idea. There was a fair difference in the uh, incidence of plots showing positive plants. And the high was Blackville, South Carolina. It turns out uh, the Hill Country or Piedmont, I should say, in South Carolina, they, they actually have a fairly high virus titer or incidence in that area in, uh, in cotton. Other areas were Prattville, Alabama, uh, Panhandle, Florida, and then South Alabama, which are areas where we had seen a lot of virus um, in the previous years. Still in the southern part of, uh, uh, of the United States, J. Florida's in the Florida Panhandle, Neil Bruton, so basically the same amount of disease there. Uh, and all of those are within the same mean separation groups. And then as you get generally, except for Fairhope, you get further away from the Gulf Coast, the incidence of positive plants declines. And then it, when you really get far away, like Jackson, Tennessee, or uh, Mariana, Arkansas, uh, essentially, at least as far as the survey is concerned, really didn't find any virus in those areas at all. So Certainly, the survey program showed that the percentage of positive plots varied by location. Go ahead, Cassie. Cultivars. Uh, with it, you know, as Cassie mentioned earlier, the entomologists have tried to use or screen with insecticides and to reduce the incidence of cotton leaf roll dwarf disease, and it hadn't worked. With these, this type of disease, as the Brazilians and the Argentinians have found out, the idea is to identify um, disease resistant or tolerant germplasm as a means of, of managing this disease. And we did include the BRS 293 uh, Brazilian line, which I believe is resistant to the typical strain. And then the BRS 286, I think, is resistant to both strains of the cotton leaf or old dwarf virus found in, uh, in South America. And it turned out they, along with most of the other lines that we screened, had similarly high levels of disease. Or, yeah. The only cultivar that had, where there was a possible reduction in the incidence of uh, cotton leaf or old dwarf virus reduced number of positive plots was the Dynagro 3615, which was kind of an, 
a surprise in that that variety has been identified as having issues with bronze wilt, yet it looks like uh, among all the lines that we screened, it may have some resistance to uh, cotton leaf rolled dwarf virus infections. Cassie? There wasn't really a lot to say about the association with symptoms or the symptoms we were that were screened for or uh, looked for and the occurrence of CLRDV infections. The only symptom pattern where we had a higher association um, with infection with this virus as compared with a non-treated control was the leaf bronzing. So that tended to be associated with uh, symptoms of, or infections by, you should say, cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. Really the rugosity, and you could get rugosity with if one thing with just the aphids feeding themselves. So that symptom pattern may or may not be associated with, uh, with this disease. The leaf cupping, again, uh, something could be associated with uh, drought stress or some other stresses, and perhaps the same thing could be said for the tenting. So the problem was, and it, it, this has been an issue with this disease all along, is, is clearly, clearly identifying certain symptom patterns with cotton leaf roll dwarf disease. And they just seem to be a, enough variation that it's almost impossible to go out there and look at cotton and say for sure when you see a plant with symptoms that you think are cotton leaf roll dwarf disease, say for sure, without having that real-time PCR test, whether or not it actually is infected with the virus. It, it's, it's a very frustrating situation trying to uh, um, do field surveys for this particular disease. Cassie? Now, Marcio tried to as I said before, he rated the different symptom patterns at each of the locations. This just happens to be from 2021. You can see that there were differences in the association with uh, some of the symptom, different symptom patterns at different locations. They're certainly not the same across the board, but as I mentioned a minute ago, that there are other possible causes for these symptoms and was very difficult to associate any of those uh, with the disease um, without the PCR test. Cassie? So in summary, uh, you know, this the symptoms of this disease have been in, uh, uh, to some degree or another have been or were identified in uh, all the states by PCR test except for uh, Arkansas and Tennessee in this survey. Now, the disease has actually been found in those states, states but the level of disease in those areas is, is very low. The highest confirmed incidence is in the southeastern uh, United States, which is the main cotton production area. Um, we didn't see it in, um, uh, I mean, there was a little bit in Texas, essentially none in Virginia. Uh, we didn't have sampling done in West Texas, which is a major cotton production region, so we don't know whether, uh, I think there's been a positive out there, but we really don't know what the incidence of cotton leaf roll dwarf disease might be, uh, might be in that area. There were, the only cultivar difference that was detected, again, was the Donna Grove 3615, as compared with the other commercial or uh, uh, the other breeding lines that we, uh, we screened uh, at the different locations. It was disappointing that the Brazilian lines were resistant to either the typical or the typical and atypical strains proved to be susceptible to the strain of cotton leaf roll dwarf virus that we have in the United States. That came as a bit of a surprise. There were some differences in cultivars by site differences for the symptom patterns. But as I said, there is that issue of associating symptoms with real infections. I know that, uh, as Cassie mentioned, the titer of the virus can be very low. It may be low enough, the plants may be infected, but they're not, they're not gonna test positive on PCR. 
So again, it creates a lot of issues when trying to do any assessments to look at the uh, incidence of disease over locations or get any good idea of the field resistance of cultivars um, in screening trials. So as I said, the visual quantification is very difficult and we really need to come up with some other means of trying to assess the occurrence of this disease in cotton. We're not gonna repeat the Sentinel trial this year uh, uh, over the region. Uh, I think Amanda is going to do it here in Alabama. Uh, we've had some pretty good success in doing the trials here and at least probably cut the number down but work in those locations where we've had a lot of uh, disease pressure in the past. And maybe the ne next step would be identify some of the environment, excuse me, environmental factors that may influence symptom expression. Thank you. And these are just the individuals that were involved in the survey per se, and Cassie's already gone through all of this. So, the next speaker is Amanda, and she is currently conducting the survey program here in Alabama. Uh, so thank you, Austin and Cassie. So as I mentioned, I'm basically going to kind of just narrow the focus from what Austin talked about with the distribution of the virus throughout the cotton belt to just focusing on the Alabama sentinel plots for results. So next. Uh, so in terms of the number of sentinel plots, in Alabama, we, we had the most locations out of all the states. We actually had five uh, different sentinel plot trials established throughout the state, one in North Alabama in the Tennessee Valley area in Belmina. We had one in Central Alabama in Prattville, one in Southeast Alabama in the Wiregrass area in Headland, Alabama. And we actually had two in Southwest Alabama in Bruton and Fairhope because uh, that's kind of where we saw the most disease, you know, prior to setting up these sentinel plots. As Austin mentioned, as well as Cassie, we, we looked at some different varieties based on years. I'm only going to talk about the sentinel plot results for 2020 and 2021, just for the sake of time. Uh, but in 2020, we had phytogen 480, delta pine 1646, dinogro 3615, an experimental breeding line, as well as a Pima variety, a Delta Pine 359. In 2021, we dropped the experimental breeding line and the Pima variety and added Phytogen 500 as uh, Drew Skrishmer, who was the initial alert person for this disease in Alabama, mentioned in some of his trials that he saw that was pretty expressive, kind of similar to the levels that Phytogen 480 had. Uh, so the trials conducted at Fairhope, Belmina, and Wiregrass only had a single planting date. We planted it later, about June 1st, at each location. So as we saw, the later planted cotton was a little bit more susceptible, uh, more at risk for yield impacts to cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. Uh, but the trials conducted in Bruton and Prattville, we also assessed the impact of planting dates. We had two planting dates at May 1st and June 1st at both locations. So it was a split plot design with planting date as the main plot and then cotton variety as the split plot treatment. Next. So in terms of data collection, we sampled a little bit more intensively in Alabama in 2020 and 2021. And then some of the other states did. So we just did initial some additional sampling to what the sentinel plot group was doing as a whole. So beginning at 30 days after planting and continuing at two week intervals um, until 120 days after planting, we sampled 10 of the most upper fully expanded leaves from each plot to do some aphid counts to just keep a track of when those aphid flights were coming in, where we saw the most um, pressure in terms of aphids for the vector for the virus. Uh, in the state of Alabama. We also rated for symptoms of cotton leaf roll dwarf disease. In terms of sampling, what we sent to Cassie, kind of at 30 day intervals, we selected one mature leaf from an asymptomatic plant and a symptomatic plant if it was present um, for testing for PCR. At Gulf Coast, Wiregrass of Tennessee Valley, we either sampled kind of at 60, 90, or 120 days, depending on the year. But at Bruton and Prattville, we had some additional funding from Cotton Incorporated to sample at 30, 60, 90, and 120 days, as Cassie mentioned. Uh, throughout the season, we were tagging plants um, and then going back and tagging if they were negative or positive. 
So at the end of the season, we could remove those entire plants to, you know, look at some growth parameters in terms of bowl counts, um, how plant height, uh, bowl set, and lint yield. And we also harvested the two center rows of um, each plot to record those yields and grades as well. Next. So as both Cassie and Austin mentioned, we had a really hard time identifying this disease based on symptoms alone. And these pictures are just to reiterate that point where um, you could have two plants exhibiting the same type of symptoms. On the left, we have some you know, leaf rugosity, one plant tested negative, one tested positive. They were sampled both at 90 days, just different varieties. Uh, we also had some bronzing on the pictures on the right, one tested positive, one tested negative. It could be a tighter issue, as Cassie mentioned, just with cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, uh, but also as Austin hinted at, you know, some environmental factors and other issues, aphid feeding, or um, as well as just drought stress or heavy rains can cause some compounding issues that can mask symptoms. Next. So I won't spend too much time on it, but I'll just kind of reiterate kind of what Austin said that you know, we saw kind of a range of symptoms from year to year and in locations. In terms of Alabama, you know, sometimes we would see some leaf distortion, curling or rolling of the leaves and some leaf rugosity. Uh, and these would routinely come up positive for the virus. Um, we kind of see that leaf rugosity at different points in the season. Early on, though, um, if they're infected really early, that can be easily confused with thrips damage, which is pictured on the upper right. So overall, just a very challenging aspect of identifying the virus in the field. Next slide. But definitely the most common symptom that we saw in Alabama was that late summer leaf reddening or bronzing. Uh, it doesn't photograph as well as it does in, you know, seeing it in person, especially with a pair of polarized sunglasses. Uh, but you can get this just general bronzing or reddening of the leaves. Sometimes we get tenting, sometimes we don't. Uh, and that can also be caused by different issues. And we've also heard of the bronze wilt disease, as Cassie mentioned, and we're trying to see, some are trying to see if that's associated with the virus or not, but we do see that bronzing pretty commonly in Alabama in 2020 and 2021. So some other symptoms that kind of occur a little bit more sporadically, but we do get them coming up positive via PCR for the virus. We will sometimes see red stems, node stacking or bunching at the, the top of the plant. Um, and if it's early on, uh, we also may see some stunting as well. Next slide. Uh, we haven't seen as much of the extenuated verticality as Austin mentioned. I know that City Bag and Georgia has seen some of that last year, uh, but just in Alabama, we haven't seen as much of that in 2020 and 2021. So getting into the results for Alabama, overall um, incidence has kind of decreased the last two years when compared to 2019. Last year was a very wet year in Alabama, um, especially in Southwest Alabama, where we had heavy rains just coming in throughout the season, which actually kept aphid pressure low, um, which was good for producers in terms of um, lessening their worry about cotton leaf roll dwarf virus. So we are really curious to see how weather impacts you know, aphid flights and CLRDV incidents, maybe a drier year is where we're going to see more of the virus is just something that we're kind of more curious about as time goes on. But overall, just as within the cotton belt, CLRDV incidence does vary within the state of Alabama. Uh, and it can vary by year as well. In 2020, incidence was actually greatest in Fairhope, kind of followed by Prattville and Bruton. And it was virtually non-existent as you, you know, go towards Tennessee Valley. Uh, Belmina area. I think we only had three positives um, towards the end of the season at that 120 day sampling, but in 2021, we did not detect it at all in Tennessee Valley. And interestingly, we didn't detect it at all last year in Fairhope as well. And I suspect more of that has to do with maybe a tighter where if we sampled a little bit past 120 days, uh, maybe we've gotten a little bit more virus, but overall the aphid pressure was very low in that location. So as Austin mentioned, uh, 
we haven't had a variety that hasn't come up positive for the virus. Um, we've detected it in all six varieties that we've looked at in 2020 and 2021, in addition to those Brazilian lines that are resistant to the atypical and typical strain of the virus. Um, in terms of when we first detected it, uh, in 2020, we found it as early as 45 days after planting. Um, it showed up a little bit later last year at 60 days after planting, but incidence is influenced by variety as Austin mentioned. Um, in 2020 and 2021, those kind of more semi-indeterminate kind of aggressive varieties like phytogen 480 and 500 are definitely more expressive in terms of symptoms. They get a lot of that bronze bronzing or bronze wilt. Um, and Delta Pine 1646 is close behind it. Uh, but for some reason, as Austin mentioned, the last couple of years with Dynagro 3615, although we selected it hoping that it would show more of that bronze wilt, we don't see a lot of symptoms in that variety. It could be more tolerant, uh, but at this point, we're not really sure, but it might be something for our cotton breeders to take a closer look at. So in terms of CLRD incidence as impacted by planting date, it is higher in that later planted cotton. It's not always statistically higher, uh, but we do see at least a numerical increase when you're looking at that later planted cotton. Uh, I didn't show any of the yield data for these trials uh, as we didn't see any yield impacts. Now, part of that is just a struggle when we're looking at small plots versus larger fields, uh, you know, compared to what a commercial producer would do. Uh, but overall, we've been having a hard time gauging those yield impacts in these smaller studies. Next slide. Uh, so just some conclusions about CLRDV in the U.S. and Alabama. Uh, you know, we now really consider it to be part of the environment. Um, and as Austin and I have mentioned and Cassie, the symptoms and incidents are going to vary by location, region, variety, and also planting date. Um, overall, we've had a very hard time, not just in our sentinel plots, but other trials as well, gauging those yield impacts. Um, they can be quite variable, um, you know, but we have kind of found that if plants display symptoms earlier on in the season, they're more at risk for yield impacts. Um, and as Austin and Cassie mentioned, depending on years, um, some extension specialists in some fields have observed a reduction in the number of bowls, open bowls, and fruiting nodes. But overall, based on what we've seen the last two years, we would say that yield impacts have been low throughout the Southeast, at least in 2020 and 2021. So just to kind of follow up with some, you know, future thoughts and some management recommendations, as Cassie mentioned, there's been some pretty good extensive surveys looking at alternative hosts and overwintering sources for CLRDV. Uh, Cassie's done some uh, some good surveys on this, as well as some researchers out of Georgia, and they've actually detected it in 23 different weed species, including hennebit, evening primrose, and white clover. And we've also found it to overwinter in those cotton stalks or the regrowth of the leaves have been known to harbor CLRDV. So in terms of moving forward, what are we recommending to producers? Um, as Cassie and Austin mentioned, you can't you know, manage the virus, uh, you know, with extensive sprays targeting the aphid vector of the virus. Um, but we are kind of recommending producers do a stock destruction, a good winter weed burn down. And going into 2022, that may be a little bit more challenging for producers just due to supply issues with herbicides and the rising costs. But we're still recommending that it's just a general good practice for cotton production in general to kind of eliminate some of that green bridge from one season to the next. Um, and we're definitely recommending producers plant early, especially if they've had issues in the past. Um, future research, we're looking at uh, kind of how deep tillage and winter cover could affect the overwintering of CLRDV and aph aphid pressure as well. Um, and we're hoping to identify some resistant or tolerant varieties in the future, as that'll be really our best line of defense for managing this virus. So that'll end our, our webinar today. I just wanted to end the slide with our contact information for Cassie, Austin, and myself. And just a really big, huge thanks to our Auburn University CLRDV research team and our collaborators throughout the Southeast. Um, and in Alabama, we could not do our research trials without the station crew at our experiment stations. We've gotten several funding sources uh, for these Sentinel plots and other research uh, for CLRDV at Auburn, um, the Southern IPM Center, the Alabama Cotton Commission, Cotton Incorporated, 
um, USDA, NEFA, and the CPPM program, as well as the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. Thank you so much, Amanda. And um, if you have time, please do stick around because we are going to take some questions. But before you go, if you could just take this short survey for the Southern IPM Center. Um, it helps us make sure that our webinars are on the mark and, and um, that we have, you know, that we're providing information that you find helpful. Um, so the first question is, I have a better understanding of cotton leaf roll dwarf virus after attending this webinar and you do uh, agree to disagree. And then um, I have a better understanding of cotton leaf roll dwarf virus working group. And then I'm more aware of potential working group regional impacts. And then finally, I have a better understanding of the importance of IPM. So if you could just take a second to um, fill that out, that would be wonderful. And that really helps us a lot. Um, and while you guys are doing that, I am gonna go ahead and ask one question. Um, Lacey would like to know, was a sentinel plot established via University of California um, for the cotton acreage in the San Joaquin Valley? And whoever wants to answer that is fine. <laughs> Cassie may disagree with me, but I think that um, Judith Brown is, she's located at the University of Arizona. And I think that she has actually been screened, they're screening for viruses in general in hours already have been prior to this occurrence in Arizona and California. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting here drawing a blank. Uh, they, do they have a Bagamo virus, if I'm not mistaken, in cotton to some degree out there in, uh, in Arizona, Cassie? Yes. Mm. Yeah, Judy's doing a lot of work over um, in the cotton on the West Coast. So we, we only included up through Texas. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, and we have another question. Um, it says, hi, Amanda, you counted number of aphids on cotton leaves. Did you see any correlation between number of aphids and CLRDV incidence or virus? Uh, well, I don't know what that last word is, but did you see any um, correlation between that? Uh, yeah, so it looks like they're asking about virus titer. We didn't look specifically, you know, with the number of aphids and then virus titer, but that could be something that we're looking into in the future. Um, we were mainly testing for these samples with conventional PCR, uh, but Cassie has worked on vetting a real-time PCR assay, so that could potentially be used to look more at titer in the, the plant as well as the aphids later on. But in terms of the correlation between the number of aphids and CLRDV incidents, typically we haven't finished analyzing the data, um, Austin and I have recruited Dr. Alana Jacobson, who's our research entomologist here to mull over some of that data, but just a general overview without looking at statistics with it, uh, where you do see more heavy aphid pressure, you do see more CLRDV incidents. So that kind of attributed to why I think we didn't see as much in Fairhope uh, in 2021 as we did in 2020. Um, our actually highest aphid pressure last year was in Wiregrass. Um, and so I think with the heavy rains that reduced that, you know, aphid pressure as well as CLRDV in Fairhope, uh, but it kind of upticked in the wiregrass area. So there's definitely a correlation there. We just haven't finished analyzing the data where I can present it. And we also have an uh, entomologist here at Auburn University, and they have been doing some um, sentinel plot work with the aphids. Um, they're still in the process of identifying and counting different aphid species. Great. Thank you so much for that answer. And it doesn't look like we have um, any more questions coming in, but I always like to ask this. So I'm going to go in order of um, your presentations. So if you had to leave the attendees today with one thing that you want them to remember from the webinar, what would it be? So Cassie, I'll go with you first. I want them to remember that they cannot control the disease using insecticides. <laughs> but I also want to say that if anybody out there suspects that they have cotton leaf roll dwarf virus, they can send samples to our lab and we can 
test for them, and we can also include them in the variant monitoring program. Great, that's such important information. What about you, Austin? Well, I think it there, there's a lot of opportunities to work on uh, on this disease. It, it from the survey work, it looks like you probably have to be in Alabama, Georgia, or Florida really to, uh, uh, and maybe South Carolina and South Carolina to really work on it. But we really do need work on uh, variety sensitivity, identifying resistance, uh, and then if we do get it or identify resistance, getting it into some uh, commercial lines, because it looks like under some circumstances, this disease can have a tremendous impact on yield. It just looks like it, based on what we've seen the last two years, it, it kind of comes and goes. So, but we need to get ahead of it just in case it intensifies sometime in the future. Perfect. Thank you. And then finally, Amanda, what would you like to leave us with? Well, I think Cassie and Austin's points are really important. And, you know, we're still, the bottom line is we're still doing research on this. We're still learning as we're going. We have a little bit better understanding of certain aspects of like what type of symptoms that we're seeing, but there's definitely plenty of research areas that we were interested in the future. We're really interested in how weather from year to year is impacting what we're seeing incidence wise. Um, so even though incidence has been low the last two years, we could still have a heavy year like we did when we first kind of saw it, you know, 2018, 2019. Um, so it hasn't gone away. It's just kind of hiding out 